Taking Niger Seriously, a three-day conference which began at the University of Lagos. On Monday, the 16th of March, was the highlight of celebrating the 70th birthday of elder statesman, author, poet, and poemist, Odia Ofemu. The humble, integrity-driven Nigerian who hails from Edo State in the South-South Nigeria believes in the unity of mind, purpose, and progress for the citizens of the country of his birth. As he celebrates his induction into the Septuagenarian Club, he joins us now from his home in Ikeja, Lagos, on the state of the Nigerian nation. It's a pleasure uh, talking to you, Odia Alfemu, poet, writer, goodness me, I can go on and on, but happy birthday to you. And uh, coronavirus, because it's very key in the state of the nation today, what's your reaction to this as we start to talk about the state of the nation? It took me by surprise, as it took most people in the world by surprise. Every year, every year, I always try to read Nostradamus, but in the past two years, I never read Nostradamus to find out what would happen in 2019 and 2020. And that's just when the surprise of the coronavirus came. But seriously, it's like a war that has no front. There is nowhere in the world in which the war is not being fought. And because nobody has a clue, the, the thought that the world might be coming to some kind of end, ending is there. True, some kind of ending is already take, taking place. Even if the problem of coronavirus was solved today, so many economic organizations we have gone under. And in fact, the threat of famine overtaking very many communities in the world is there. It is a problem, uh, what looks like a medical problem to which no vaccine has been found, no, no cure has been found, and we are not too sure, in spite of local, local prophets telling us that it might end within a few days, we are all just like sitting dogs waiting for the worst to happen. Well, Odia, when you it's look... Like, it's like the... Indeed. And when you look at the life well, expectancy... I, I, I like to put... I... Go ahead, go ahead. I mean... I don't want the world to end in my time. And I'm very sure very many people do not want the world to end just yet. So uh, we may have to consider a drastic form of creativity to halt it. The hope is that some of the prophecies might be true, that in a few, in a few days, it might be gone. If, if, if Nostradamus says it will go away and come back after 10 years, it does look like something to, to, to think about because Nostradamus is not always wrong. After 700 years, he manages to get some of these things. Well, you have lived through many of the great events of post-independence Nigeria and even many disease uh, pandemic. And achieving 70 is no small feat, especially when you look at the life expectancy uh, rate and ratio. So congratulations to you. But let me ask you, from that factory worker at Ijorabadia, area of Lagos, to the press secretary of the great chief of Bafemi Awolowo, and then to this renowned international poet. Uh, tell me, Odia, is there something you would have changed, uh, given the benefit of hindsight? To be honest with you, every Every problem I have suffered in the world contributed to making me the person I am. And I usually don't regret things that happen to me because they always contribute to making me better in one way or the other. I never believed I would die young, although at, at a certain stage of my life, I feared it could happen because, I mean, people frightened my mother into believing that this child of hers may not may not last the distance. But 
I always knew I would last the distance. And I told my mother, it would not happen to me. And that she should have no fears at all. Because as a younger woman, she was so proud that she spent a great part of her life trying to have a son. And she was unlucky. She had so many miscarriages as a result. But one day, I sat her down and I said, even if there was a witch on every leaf in this town, they won't be able to do anything terrible to me. And in any case, don't beg any babala who made seem mad, pastor, or anything. I would not die, and I would live to bury you. I lived to bury her. And somehow, the kind of faith I had in my living, living longer than was supposed by, 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 the, by the prophets. Well, I'm convinced that there is more that I can still do, and even coronavirus will not make me give up the hope I, I have that we can build a civil place. Okay, Mr. Okay, if, Mr. If you can hear me now, if, I want to just quickly shift your attention to another uh, news story that has been making the rounds. Of course, um, I'm speaking about the Abule Ado explosion, which you know happened last week Sunday and you know, made a lot of Nigerians uh, feel very, very terrible because it could be avoided. Now, the Speaker of the House of Reps has come out to say that you know this is an explosion that could have been avoided, actually because of the degree of devastation it has brought to the Nigerian people. What are the lessons that you think we, could, we can learn from this as to moving forward and making sure that it doesn't happen again? We've always needed a different kind of security architecture in Nigeria, a level of self-concern that makes it possible for things that are not properly set to be taken care of. There is an overview, overview culture that does not exist amongst us. And in most cases, it, it, it happens, in most cases, it happens because the way our security systems used to be structured is no longer the way it is. There are too many interventions from non-institutional sources and it is precisely those non-institutional sources that dislocate what normally amounted to a security watch. If people talk about security, it is not only about preventing violence in society. It is about ensuring that things happen as they are supposed to in almost every sector. And talking about every sector, it begins with education, health, employment, just name it. When I came to, to Lagos, an, an unemployed person knew that if you went to the Ministry of Labor, your name would be recorded, and wherever there was a job of the kind you needed, you would be called on a, you would be called on a Thursday, or you could go there on a Thursday to check. Now, security is about getting things done as they should be done, and in a manner that protects every citizen. When only a few citizens are considered important enough to be protected, trouble always manages to come. If people who are on the road, who are supposed to be, to be concerned with road traffic, and there is nobody who would immediately checkmate or cross-check, things are bound to happen the way they've just happened. Okay. Okay, so uh, as we still celebrate your 70th, we'll, we'll go through a portfolio of issues. I'd like to talk to you about uh, the politics, you know, being played in the 70s and 80s, leading up to the First Republic. I know you have a very sound uh, uh, relationship with Chief Obafemi Awolowo, and uh, you were in the vanguard of all of this, you know, why we led up to the First Republic, the Shagari elections and the likes. And I want you to juxtapose that with the politics being played now in the country. Any similarities? And tell us one or two things. Maybe we probably have not heard about the late sage. The politics that took over Nigeria at independence prepared the way for the politics that has shattered the basis for 
normal life across Nigeria. I never stopped talking about how the sharing out of the loot of independence was so poorly done that things were never going to be the same again. I put it this way. There was a coalition of the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons and the Northern People's Congress. In 1958, Namdi Azikwe had been made to accept to be Governor General of Nigeria. But at independence, the NCNC people were told that if they formed a coalition with any group like the Action Group, they would have too much competition because there are too many educated Yoruba and too many educated Igbo. And that it was best, there, it was best therefore, to have a coalition with the NPC that won't be able to cover all the, all, the, uh, all, all the places available. Now, a share out of, of, of roles took place. The NCNC took over virtually over, all, all, all the in the civil service that were strategic enough to, to, to control the system. The NPC waited. It was as if people thought they didn't know what they were waiting for. Then it suddenly came out that they had taken over all the railway extensions, all the military installations, the Kanji Dam, and they took over also the iron and steel industry that was going to come. It was at the point at which the, the NCNC and the who formed that coalition, it was at the point at which they discovered they were merely fleeting on the surface of the ground owned by the NPC that the idea of disrupting the system began. Zeke refused to call Balewa to form a government. From that day, Nigeria entered a new way of looking at the world because Balewa had to call in the army. And it was only then Namdi Azikwe discovered that although he was called commander in chief of the armed forces, he could not command the army. Only the prime minister, according to the Commonwealth tradition, could command the army. From that moment, all the soldiers on either side were planning a coup to ensure that they took over the system. From, to, from that moment on, we have had no picture of the future that was not messed up by this fear of one group taking over from another. So that by, by January 15, when the first coup actually took place in Nigeria, it was being done as a way of preempting another coup that would have come from the Northern Axis, which was supposed to have taken place on the 17th. Mr. Ofemo, yeah, sorry to interrupt no you, but we'll have to go on a quick commercial break and we'll be back to talk some more. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Morning Show here on the Rise News. And we still have with us a poemist, uh, elder statesman, author, poet, and the list is endless, Odia Ofemu, who's joining us from his home in Ikeja here in Lagos. Thank you so much for staying with us, Mr. Ofemu. You were making the point, but let me just add this question to it because it's sort of uh, related. Three years ago, you granted an interview on a live broadcast where you said, I don't think the British really wanted Nigeria to be a very successful country. I know Project Nigeria is very dear to you, but almost 60 years after, are you still blaming the colonial masters? To put it, to put it very nicely, in the year I was born, 1950, there was an all-Nigeria conference taking place in which decisions were being taken about the kind of future Nigeria should have. The same questions that were asked at that conference are the questions we are still asking. And from where I stopped earlier on, we have had a country of competitive regionalisms and com backed by competitive ethnicities have been so. It was possible to have created a system in which all the ethnic groups 
and fractions that we are going to occupy Nigeria into the future will put all their cards on the table and decide how they would want their life to be, to, to, to be run and lived. It has not happened like that because we never quite haggled enough. The British were always intervening to ensure that only what they wanted would happen. As early as 1902, Lugard had set for ensuring that the part of the country that he was in control, he believed that you needed to have an ethnic group that would command the North, and the North would then command Nigeria. The British, therefore, would have a very, they called it a dual mandate. They allowed our own our own leaders, that is to say the indigenous leaders, to take care of the country while they took care of those leaders. The pattern has never really quite changed. And whenever there was going to be a change because Nigerians were opposed to that format, they also intervened. And they have intervened at every stage, including the intervention during the Civil War. Many people forget that the coup, of January 15 took place at a time when Britain was not going to allow any such coup to happen. And they intervened in the process of the carrying out of the pogroms. They were there. The British were part of that formation. And because we ourselves have not investigated our history enough, we blame one another. It is true. We lost a sense of justice, such that, for instance, we blame the Igbo as a nationality for a crime committed by a few majors who could just have been rounded off and tried. In the same way, the pogroms in the north were organized by a group of people who were identifiable, who were well known, so that because you did not take care of those who were really guilty, whole nationalities were turned into criminals, and we have had this sorry history of people blaming everybody without making a distinction between the truly guilty and the non-guilty. What we have created for ourselves is no longer a country planning to advance. It is simply a country in which whoever is in power tries to destroy the advantages belonging to others so that they would always be in control. Nigeria has never really enjoyed, since those early days, has never really enjoyed a communal sense of development making. We have always in such a manner that cohesive understanding of the way the world works has all of us. And we can go beyond it. And the reason we are not going beyond it is that we no longer listen to ourselves. Once the ideological makings were, were fractionized and regionalized, people no longer listen to those on the other side. Let's face it. If every Nigerian child went to school and health was available to everybody, and we knew that once you were out of or school, you would get a job. And you know that at the end of your life, you, towards the end of your life, you will have a proper pension scheme that covered you. We would have a different kind of country. But many people do not want such a country. They put their children in a state where they are no longer part of a normal human existence. They are above the normal human existence. They do not want other people's children to enjoy the facilities their own would enjoy. And we have allowed robbery to become a major issue. And by the way, when I use the word robbery, let me be very frank with you. I am not one of those who say that stealing is corruption. Stealing is not corruption. On that one, good Lord Jonathan was right. Stealing is not corruption. Stealing is a crime. When you call it cor corruption, you are excusing it. You are, you are implying that it could be just something to be negotiated before we find out what it really is. Because we have allowed stealing to be defined as corruption, 
Nigeria has been blunted to the point where, as I keep saying, only about 30% of the income we make in this country is effective. The rest of it is waste, waste, and waste. are definitely a, a history aficionado and never in Nigeria's history have we seen this phenomena of social distancing and bringing back the, uh, the, the topic of coronavirus COVID-19. Now only yesterday the federal government uh, ordered a travel ban and shut down three airports including uh, the Malamaminu Kano International Airport uh, in Kano, in Enugu and Port Harcourt. However they have stayed away from the Murutala Mohammed Airport and Namdi Adikwe Airport, which we know have a larger number of people coming into the country. Now, accessing the way the federal government has tried to stop the spread of this disease, how would you react to this? The coronavirus, because we don't have a cure for it, it's like something outside the pale of genuine human reasoning. We are responding in knee-jerk fashion that may not, in fact, be related to the problem in any way. But one of the, one of the first observable, observable uh, uh, things is that since coronavirus took center stage, Almost all the other problems everywhere else in the world has receded. The terrorists are on holidays. I'm sure they no longer know whether the person they will be they will be arrested, they will be kidnapping has coronavirus. It becomes a, a, a situation of our need to look at a future immediate and long term, in which Nigerians who would not be able to come together can still manage to have a way of dealing with communal problems, because those problems do not go away simply because we no longer gather. When we can't gather, the problems increase. It is actually a good way of educating all of us to see that a world in which people do not interact and intermix is a world that is due for tragedy. And that tragedy can only be taken care of by people thinking a way of having people on their own, but who can communicate with one another by some, by some method. That method has not yet been properly uh, designed. And the knee-jerk responses of today are not addressing how we will be acting when we would have successfully prevented human, uh, all citizens from gathering, from meeting, and from, God knows, it could lead to famine everywhere. How do you deal with that kind of famine? These are the issues we need to consider. If markets close today, that means we have already allowed coronavirus to simply wipe out whole populations. There must be a way of taking it through so that even when people cannot gather, they may be able to get fed. There must be a way of inventing it. Unfortunately, we have not always had the kind of proactive uh, agencies in government to deal with it. But this is an emergency, and I think it was time we started learning how to, how to do it. Okay, I'll, I'll come in here, but just to alert you, we might, we'll be going on a break very soon, so in case we caught you, just to uh, pre-inform you, sir, a very good perspective there as regards the coronavirus. I mean, a lot of people are saying maybe God wants a reset for the world. Uh, that's why this uh, has started. But I want to take you back to the antecedents of the formation of Nigeria itself. Uh, a man you admire so much, Femi Aolo, it was alleged that he said that Nigeria is just a geographical expression. Uh, way back in many of his writings. Uh, there's another man called Maximilian Zeglio. In, 19, in 1947. In 1947. There's another man called Maximilian Zeglio because Italy came into be just the way Nigeria came into be. So Maximilian Zeglio did say that we made Italy. It's time to make Italians. Did you feel 
that based on what Obafemi Awolo was saying, we didn't take our time to make Nigerians, and they are not true Nigerians. We'll go on a quick break. We'll come back and respond to that. Thank you, sir. All right, welcome back to the morning show here on Arise uh, News. And we have uh, Audio family here, poet, author, uh, polymers. Uh, real quickly, would just like to take your, your view on that question I did ask. I mean, uh, have we been able to build true Nigerians owing to the fact that uh, did say that Nigeria was just a magical expression in 1947? When I, when I always said that he was using a term that was very popular uh, during the Second World War, Metternich, the German, was the one who made it very famous. Uh, when you bring together a group of uh, many, many nationalities without having something to bind them together, there is a sense in which you can call them a mere geographical expression. The alternative to a geographical expression is a cultural expression. Awolowo appeared to have spent all his life trying to move that geographical expression to a cultural expression by demanding a common education policy, a health policy that covers all the population, and ensuring, I mean, all those, all those uh, uh, welfare, welfare issues that became popular in Nigeria were those things that could have led us to turning Nigeria into a cultural expression. A people who, no matter the differences in languages and ethnicity, would be able to act as from a commonality of goals and a commonality of, well, shall we call it, access to inform information. Unfortunately, our law was not generally accepted as the oracle which he was, because our law's position was a very simple one. If you want to turn a country from a geographical expression to a cultural expression, you, you should start by ensuring, for one, that all the knowledge in the English language will be taken into the indigenous languages, and all the knowledge in the indigenous languages will be transferred into the English language. You bring together all the nationalities in the country, and you make it possible for cooperation or competition to take place between Nigerians and between the colonized and the colonizer in a manner that made all of us common human beings and common citizens. That way you build, you build a cultural expression from a people of diversities. Unfortunately, not many Nigerians wanted that to happen. In fact, up to 2020, we are still having a situation of people disavowing the necessity for ethnic homelands. And in fact, ethnic groups were so criminalized across Nigeria that it was difficult, it was very difficult to convince some people that it was not ethnicity that was bad, but our attitude towards it, our inability to manage the relationship between various ethnic groups. We all need the same things. And to be very honest, Nigerians are not as different as we claim that we are. I have consistently argued the point that if the Igbo, the Yoruba, the Fulani, and so many other ethnic nationalities across Nigeria are of the same language group, the Kwa Niger Congo language group, we ought to realize that the, the, the mere administrative demarcations between, between peoples that we embark upon should be along lines of the differences that exist. The Yoruba are not a different people from the Fulani. The Fulani are not a different people from the Igbo. They may have passed through this area at different times in history. But when you look the, at the whole of Africa, most of, the, most of the migrations took place from around us into East Africa, into Southern Africa. We are one people. And if Africa is to thrive and develop, 
We need to be able to see ourselves as one people who need a sense of common responsibilities, a sense of common respons responses to our environment. And it is not by denying federalism, because federalism is actually what it requires. Because the little differences that, the, I mean, the many differences that history has brought to our doors cannot be resolved by a unitary principle. Because we migrated at different times, I have related and distanced ourselves one way or the other, we do need a principle that allows all of, that allows all of us to have independence, freedom within our cultural geographies, so that our relationship with other cultural geographies will be based on mutual respect. We have not built such a country. We have been working against having that commonality of interest. And what do they put in the place of these commonalities of interest? They bring in religion. They bring in issues that, frankly, do not pertain to the survivability of our people. It is possible for Nigerians who share very different uh, who, who share very different ethnicities, religions, languages, to live normal human lives because we give to every individual in society what, that indivi what is due to that individual. Indeed. It is possible to have a great country. Yeah. Thank God the English language came from colonialism. So we do have at least one means of relating before we depend on our indigenous languages. But consider that possibility, that we actually put all the knowledges in English into our indigenous languages. We would share common tendencies across various areas of human life. And what many people consider antagonistic today can be reduced to mere conversations between, between different people. The reason we are not doing that is that there are individuals and groups who think they must be lords and masters over others. No, all Nigerians must be forced to be citizens. Anybody trying to be an overlord should be fought and defeated. Indeed, we should take positive advantage of our diversity. Uh, Mr. Ofemu, let me ask you, because it has always been your dream to be the governor of Edo State, South South Nigeria. You took a shot at that dream in the 2016 elections on the platform of the Labour Party. Uh, but do tell me, did that dream die with the loss at the primaries? And what is your impression of the protracted crisis in the ruling party in Edo State at the moment? And if you will permit me to please um, intrude, what does Odia Ofemu have against love and marriage? <laughs> This looks like asking the ultimate question. <laughs> but let me begin by saying, I have, not <laughs> I have not always had the dream of becoming the governor of Edo State. I wanted to intervene to disrupt a decline that I was seeing. Actually, Edo State always looked to me in the way that Aurora looked at the Western region when he decided to go to Lagos to become opposition leader, which is to say, you know that what you have in front of you is not the ultimate. It is just a stepping stone to the real thing. Because the problem you can't solve the problems of any of the distinct groups across Nigeria by having an Edo solution, a Yoruba solution, Igbo solution. All those solutions will always fail because they are not cover all, they are not covered all enough to provide ultimate answers. Now in the case of Edo State, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't know how many times you have visited Binyan for how long. I happen to, to, to have read enough of Edo history to realize that that city has been in perpetual decay and that most of the modern things many people claim they are doing in that city are underdeveloping ideas that had been there from about the 15th century. I mean, the town planning in Benin was done in the 15th century. Uh, what has been added over the years is nothing to write home about. And you, you know that there are ways of managing a city in such a manner that it can relate to all other, all other cities in the world and stand up in stature 
comparable to what most great cities have. Now, I really genuinely believe that you can start from a local government, run that local, local government properly, which is why the idea of restructuring is about ensuring self-governance in local governments, self-governance at the level of the state, and in a way that you relate to the center from a sense of the greatness we can all build, to, build together. When you come to what the individuals are doing today, especially the individual leaderships, properly speaking, because they are too personalist in their approaches to problem solution, they can never solve the problems well. If, if, you, if you build a road in any part of you are not building a road from the creativity in income generation. You are not building the big hospitals from creativity in income generation. We have not been building civilized societies. Because the money is available and it comes from oil, you just throw it at the problem, and you are supposed to become a big man as a result. And the kind of problems that you, you are encountering between the leaders is a problem of people who are not thinking of the masses, but of acquiring the means to consistently Mr. have Mr. and retain power. Mr. Femu, because we are almost out of time, in about a minute, if you can answer my question about what you have against love and marriage. A lot of people are interested. <laughs> I'm very interested in love and marriage. I want it done properly. And if I can't do it properly, I won't do it. Have you given up? I mean, you're 70. Are you still taking a shot at marriage? Some people get married at 80, you know, but, yes. you know, I want to do it when I can still do some other things, Great. if you know Fantastic. what I mean. Fantastic. It's been such an honor to that have is... you this morning on The Morning Show, and happy belated birthday to you again. Uh, 70 is no small fit in our nation. Thank you so much for what you do. We really oh. do appreciate you. All right, very Thank exciting you. one there. One of the most cherished 70-year-olds I've seen in a while. Yes.